Chapter 27 After the fierce storms of winter came many days when the wind did not blow. The air was so heavy that it was hard to breathe, and the sun was so hot that the sea was like, a, like the sun itself, too bright to look at. The last day of this weather, I took the canoe from the cave and paddled around the reef to the sand spit. I did not take Rantuaru with me, for while he liked the cold, he did not like the heat. It was good that he did not come with me. The day was the hottest of all, and the sea shimmered with red light. Over my eyes, I wore shields made of wood and sent small slits that I could see through. No gulls were flying, and the otter lay quiet in the kelp, and the little crabs were deep in their holes. I pulled the canoe up on the beach, which was wet but steaming from the sun. Early every spring, I took the canoe to the sand spit and speared fresh pitch in the cracks that needed it. I worked all morning, stopping from time to time to cool off in the sea. As the sun climbed high, I turned the canoe over and crawled under it and went to sleep in the shade. I had not gone long when I was suddenly awakened from, by what I thought was thunder, but upon looking out from my shelter, I saw that there were no clouds in the sky, yet the rumbling sound kept on. I, w I came from a distance and from the south, and as I listened, it grew louder. I jumped to my feet. The first thing that caught my gaze was the gleaming stretch of beach on the southern slope of the sand, sand spit. Never in my life on the island had I seen the tide so low. Rocks and small reefs that I did not know were under the sea stood bare in the blinding light. It was like another place had gone to sleep and wakened under the island. The air was suddenly tight around me. There was a faint sound as if some giant animal was sucking the air in and in through its teeth, and the rumbling came closer out of an empty sky, filling my ears. Then beyond the gleam of the beach and the bare rocks and reefs, more than a league beyond them, I saw a great white crest moving down upon the island. It seemed to move slow, more slowly between the sea and the sky, but it was the sea itself. I tore off the shields I wore over my eyes. In terror, I ran along the sand spit. I ran and stumbled and got up and ran again. The sand shuddered under my feet as the first wave struck. Spray fell around me like rain. It was filled with pieces of kelp and small fish. By following the curve of the sand spit, I could reach the cove and the tr trail that led to the mesa, but there was no time for this. Water was already rushing around my knees, pulling from every direction. The cliff rose in front of me, and though the rocks were slippery with sea moss, I found a hold, a hold for a hand and then a foot. Thus, a step at a time, I dragged myself upward. The crest of the wave paused under me and roared on toward Cor Coral Cove. For a time, there was no sound. Then the sea began to seek its old place, running backward in a long, foaming currents. Before it could do, another great wave moved out of the south. Perhaps it would be even bigger than the first one. I looked up. The cliff rose straight above me. I could climb no farther. I stood facing the rock with my feet on a narrow ledge and one hand thrust deep into a crack. Over my shoulder I could see the wave coming. It did not come fast, for the other wave was still running out. For a while I thought that it would not come at all because the two suddenly met beyond the sand spit. The first wave was trying to reach the sea, and the second one was struggling towards the shore. Like two giants, they crashed against each other. They rose high in the air, bending first one way and then the other. There was a roar as if great spears were breaking in battle, and if the red light in the sun, the spray that flew around them looked like blood. Slowly, the second wave forced the first one back, rolled slowly over it, and then, as the victor dragged the vanquished, moved in toward the island. The wave struck the cliff. It sent long tongues steaming around me so that I could neither see nor hear. The tongues of water licked into all the crevices, dragged at my hand and at my bare feet, gripping the, head, the ledge. They rose high above me along the face of the rock, up and up, then spent themselves against the sky and fell back, hissing past me to join the rotter, water rushing on toward the cove. Suddenly, all around me was quiet. In the quiet, I could still hear my heart pounding, and I knew that my hand had still had its hold on the rock and that I was alive. Night came, and though I was afraid to leave the cliff, I knew that I could never stay there until morning, that I would not would go to sleep and fall. 
Neither could I find my way home, so I climbed down from the ledge and crouched at the foot of the cliff. Dawn was windless and hot. The sand spit was strewn with hill hills of kelp. Dead fish and lobsters and pink crab lay everywhere, and two small whales were stranded against the rock walls of the cove. Far up in the trail that led to the mesa, I found things from the sea. Rantu Aru was waiting at the fence. When I crawled under it, he jumped upon me and followed me around, never letting me out of his sight again. I was glad to be home on the high headland where the waves had not come. I had only been gone from one sun to the next, yet it was like many suns, like the time I had gone away in the canoe. Most of the day I slept, but it had been many dreams, and when I awoke, everything around me was strange. The sea made no sounds on the shore. The gulls were quiet. The earth seemed to be holding its breath, as though it was waiting for something terrible to happen. At dusk, I was coming back from the spring with a basket of water on my shoulder, walking along the cliff when Rantu Aru. Everywhere, the, the ocean was smooth and yellow, and it lay against the island as if it were tired. The gulls were still quiet, perched on their rocky nests. Slowly, the earth began to move. It moved away from my feet, and for a moment, I seemed to be standing in the air. Water tipped out of the basket and trickled down over my face. Then the basket fell to the ground. Not knowing what I did, thinking foolishly that another wave was upon me, I began to run. But it was a wave, a wave of earth, and it rippled me along, um, under me along the cliff. As I ran, another wave overtook me. Looking back, I saw many of them coming out of the south like waves in the sea. The next thing I remember, I was lying on the ground, and Rantu Aru was beside me, and we were both trying to get up to our feet. Then we were running again toward the headland, toward a house that kept moving off into the distance. The opening under the fence had caved in, and I had to pull the rocks away before we could crawl through it. Night came, but the earth still rose and fell like a great animal breathing. I could hear rocks tumbling from the cliffs, falling down into the sea. All night, as we lay there in the house of earth, trembled and rocks fell. And yet, not the big one on the headland, which would have fallen if those who make the world shake had been really angry with us. In the morning, the earth was quiet once more, and a fresh wind that smelled of kelp blew out of the northern sea.